For those of us who are seated, I'm going to invite you already to open your scriptures. The address should be on the screens uh, if you're online uh, right here. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, just one verse this morning, uh, verse 13. And, uh, and then we're going to let Jesus teach us uh, from one of his sermons recorded for us in Matthew 5 about what he says. Uh, Jesus says, the true Son of God come, sent, come here sent from the Father to reveal our salvation and his will for how we should live. And so he has an amazing commentary sermon on uh, Exodus 20, uh, the giving of the law to the Israelite nation as they were moving out of Exodus into the promised land. And so we're going to let Jesus speak to us this morning through his word, uh, Exodus chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 5. Uh, that's a total of like five verses this morning. So it will go, uh, that portion will go pretty quickly. Um, but we're, then we're also going to spend uh, the painful and difficult time of... Uh, you don't have to follow me. I'm not going to move. <laughs> uh, we've been working on uh, me helping the people in the back room over there uh, follow me on the camera. I just walk off, and by the time it gets over here, then I start walking back. We're learning. Uh, so if they start, to, if you see some tape on the floor, that's my box I have to stay in. So um, over here, um, this is the commandment. We're on the sixth commandment. Thou shalt, uh, thou shalt not uh, kill. And... Uh, so we're going to be there in a little bit and understand the difficult part of that. So to help us get ready, um, there were a lot of passages uh, that uh, I spent time in over the past couple months in this regard, and all of them uh, helped shape my thinking, and one of them in particular just brought me to this really cool place to get ready. Um, in fact, there's a, a prayer here on my laptop. Let's see if I still have it open. I don't. Um, that I use this morning and I use every day before I write. Um, that before I sit down and put pen to the paper, I ask God uh, through this prayer um, that if I have any ego or pride, that I set that aside. And uh, because I love words and metrics and turns of phrases and all of those things, that none of what I say is about that, Right? that I must become invisible so he might be visible. Um, so I pray away some of those things, and then I pray into that the word of the Lord would become evident and primary, and that I would speak it well and honor him in that. And this is one of those verses that helps shape that prayer, but also leads us today. If you ever want to borrow that prayer from me, email me, terry at aliveandgenison.org, and I'll send it to you. It's a compilation of about four or five prayers from other pastors that I've just gained over the years. And uh, even this morning, I rewrote two sentences and inverted two paragraphs, because that's how it felt this morning. Um, if you would like something like that before you sit down for devotions, um, I'll send that to you, and that can be your starting place to get humble and quiet before the Lord before you open his word. Does that make sense? It does to me. Psalm uh, chapter 24, the address is on the screen, but not the words. Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6, says this, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who doesn't trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Clean hands and a pure heart. It's where we'll begin and finish today. Pray with me. Father God, we seek your face today. You are our only true God, and we seek, that, uh, we seek your face for the blessing of um, opening our hearts to the work, the transformative and cleansing work of your Holy Spirit, and if that cleansing is by fire, that you would be with us in it, if it is by a tearing and cutting away by the double-edged sword of your truth, your word, Lord, I pray that you will hold us together and help us to be enduring um, as you remove sin and install righteousness. I pray for the ministry of the peace of, the, of Christ to guard our hearts and minds, uh, that we might be washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, Lord Jesus. We stand under the banner of your name and under the covering of your blood for our purity. And so today I pray that uh, my hands will be clean, my heart will be pure, and my words will be yours. And as we open your word, I pray that you will move into our hearts to accomplish the purposes that you've established for this hour. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, straight up, here we are, uh, so let's go swimming, let's jump in, right off, ready or not, it's on the screen, just these four words, you shall not murder.
we've heard it a thousand times. It just rolls off our tongue and it can move through without much effect. Um, it's like we have a little bit of Teflon to that and I'm going to explain that in just a minute. But if you're patient with that word and you wonder what it means when the word of God, when his command teaches us, thou shalt not murder, he is saying that we should not kill with predetermination that we should not grab up vengeance and make it our own. The root of this word, to murder, to kill, means to dash someone into pieces, to destroy or obliterate them. When God added this short command uh, to the Ten Commandments for his people, it wasn't just an afterthought from heaven. It wasn't like God just said, you know, in case things go badly, I should just put this buffer in between people. And it's not just a good idea that the authors of our Republic of the United States of America penned into the Constitution. It's neither of those things. This is about our duty to all humankind. Each one a sacred creation made in the image of God. God has always been about life, and even in the context of sin, even after sin entered his creation, he would speak and act to protect. God has always been pro-life. He placed a protecting mark on Cain. Remember that, when 25% of the human population passed away after a worship service, and Cain killed his brother over the offering? And God placed a mark on Cain, and it wasn't a mark that's saying, you're a sinner. It was a mark to remind everyone else not to touch him because vengeance belongs to God. It wasn't our job. You can read about it, Genesis chapter 4, verse 15. When he recreated the world with a flood, he gave Noah a precept, and he said, you shall not take the life of another, Genesis 9, verse 6. And when he led his people out of slavery, look what he did to be pro-life. He covered them with the blood of the lamb to save them from death. He gave the command, you shall not commit murder. He puts the sign of baptism on all believers and he signs our names in his book of life. God is for real about this. He's the author of life and he protects it. So let's talk about what's on the wall here. Do not commit murder, it says. Clear and straight up. The word of God, just two words. Do not kill. That was a joke. I saw a video one time when our president stood up and said, just two words, America. <laughs> and he gave us four. Anyway, it, it was funny in my head. Uh, I'm not being political, just dumb. Uh, do not kill. That's where we are today. And uh, this for us today, this uh, little white banner, this purity white, this is what this stands for. Um, it falls on this side of purity, right? When God says, don't take someone's life. He puts it on the left side of that line of purity. And over here is the opposite of thou shalt not commit murder. The opposite. I don't want you to say anything out loud yet, but if you're taking notes, I want you to think of that one, one word. What would that be? What's the opposite of thou shalt not kill? Just think about that. We're going to go back to that space in between here in a minute. But as we talk about these two words, don't kill, you shall not murder, in a minute we'll talk about what the opposite is. Let's also say there are exceptions to that law. Numbers 35, God teaches his people that if you accidentally take someone's life, right, like it wasn't on purpose, here's how to handle that so that a human doesn't take vengeance on another human. Read it, Numbers 35. There is a justifiable homicide for protecting your family when a crime is happening. I didn't make that up. Exodus chapter 22, you can read it. And the state is empowered to enact the penalty of death in some cases. It's in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and even in the New Testament in Romans. There are exceptions for taking someone's life. But these exceptions only highlight the principle that if we take someone's life, if we commit murder, 
there is a penalty. The sanctity of human life is a principle created by the creator. That's the platform. That's the bottom line. That's the foundation on which we stand. Genesis 9, verse 6, it's on the screen. In the covenant with Noah, God spoke to Noah very, very clearly. He said, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. He's that clear. He's the creator. We're his creation. We shouldn't take his place and destroy his creation. God creates humans and they're his. They belong to him, so humans must not take the life of God's creation. If this were the extent of the law, we would all be in pretty good shape, right? I mean, you already know some things about the New Testament and Jesus' sermon in Matthew 5. You already know there's more to what goes on in committing murder. But if this was the extent of the law, maybe we'd say, wow, most of my life is on the right side of that line of purity. I have never murdered anyone. I haven't. I haven't broken this law, technically. I haven't shot anybody. I haven't committed a crime in which someone lost their life. Many humans can get pretty inflated because we don't actually technically take someone's life and we start to feel pretty good about ourselves, like, yeah, I'm good on this one, you know? There are nine more I'm still working on, but this 10th commandment, I'm, I'm doing okay. But let's ask the hard question. What about everything that happens in the human heart before? Before murder takes place. What about intent and predetermination? Remember, that's what that word means that I begin to think about it and that thought turns into a plan and that plan turns into a, re a resource and then a behavior and what about vengeance? Can my heart be full of murder even though I've never taken someone's life? What, what does destroying or obliterating a person really mean? Is, it, is the scripture only talking about their flesh, their human body? Or is it talking about something more in this law? What about all the space in between those two things, don't kill and whatever the opposite of that is? Does the Word of God help me? Does it help us to know what's going on in our hearts before we break the commandment? I think it does. This is where Jesus helps us to understand. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. I'll let you turn in there in your scriptures or turn your note card over. It's on the screen. This is the Word of the Lord from our Lord. You've heard it said... To the people long ago, you shall not murder. He was citing Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, to his listeners. The Greek word that he chose, the word in our scripture, in the Greek text means um, intentional homicide. So the same concept is what we find in the Hebrew text in Exodus 20. And anyone who murders, so he's saying, and you've also heard anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That word uh, connotes divine judgment, that God will take care of it. But... <laughs> This is where it gets messy. This, this is where Jesus starts to fill in that space between do not kill and whatever the opposite of that is. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister, if you're an only child, it still includes you. <laughs> okay? Anybody who's angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus is connecting, equating the sin of anger or sinful anger with murder. What's he talking about? That word angry um, literally means a fixed anger. Like it's attached. And you put it there. Um, like when you attach a trailer to the back of your truck and you uh, put the ball mount in and you put the pin through there and you put a lock and then if you need one of those balancing kits or whatever, the leveling kits, and you put all that together and you put the safety chains and you do all that so those two vehicles will stay attached. That's fixed together. That's this word, to be fixed, to be welded. You've already decided that that person is in the wrong. You've already decided they are wrong and there's no turning back. And in that space, we begin to think that it's our job to make everything right, to punish that other person, or to harm them with malice, to forget about the objective. There's a, an objective, a moral, real thing, a, a content of why that person offended you or whatever it is, that pretty soon we, we start to not think about what happened, but about who did it. That's what this is. When I get angry with that person and I forget the real issue, we confuse these things all the time, don't we? This is a commentary on our culture. We can't even talk or disagree anymore without sinning 
in anger. We confuse hating sin with hating people, and we just as soon solve the issue by destroying the person. This is the premise and plot of all the Jack Reacher movies. You don't have to confess that, but it's all about vengeance, right? I mean, they took his wife, and so he's out just to kill all the whole mob, anybody who comes after him. And so I don't know if it's Tom Cruise or Jack Reacher or whoever all those things are, but um, somehow we have elevated revenge to entertainment. Anger is a huge word. I mean, it covers a bunch of feelings like, and thoughts and actions. Colossians 3.8 says, rage and malice and slander and foul language. Those are some ugly cousins to, to murder. And so Jesus continues his teaching by saying that calling someone a fool, uh, raka, I'm not sure exactly how bad of a word that was, you know, if that was the N-word of their day kind of a thing. Um, but Jesus said, uh, when you call someone literally empty-headed, like you don't have a thought in your brain and you're not worth uh, the weight of the chemicals that you're created from. That's what that means. To say that they're nothing, that their thoughts mean nothing, that they're senseless. It's not just a misdemeanor. God says it's breaking his law because it steals all the value from that other person. Listen to Matthew 5, 22. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And I tell you, or but I tell you, the scripture says, and anyone who says, you fool. Same word, Racha and fool, same word will be in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus was getting at that space between, between actually killing and whatever the opposite of killing is. He was talking about our hearts, the condition of the fallen human heart, and he's making a direct connection between doing and saying harm. That killing someone is directly connected to wanting to kill them or wishing they were, or simply thinking that they're nothing, of no worth, no value, not a human made in God's image. See where this goes? A fool is someone, actually, the word of God says, someone who disregards the words of God. Proverbs 12, 15, look it up. You know the word of God, you hear the word of God, and you say, I don't need the word of God. That's what a fool really is. In Psalm 14, verse 1, and Psalm 53, verse 1, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. In Romans 1, verses 19 and 20, it says that everything that can be made known about God has already been made. It's obvious to us in the revelation, but our sin blinds us to that truth. God has made his will and his person known, but it is the fool who says, nah, nope, not going to do it. I'm going to do whatever I want. Matthew 25, verse 40, what we do to the least of these, we do to him. This one sentence is in red. I'll read it slowly. To disregard the word and revelation of God in this matter puts a person in serious danger. That's what this whole series is about. That when we move outside of God's will, we move into danger. The call is to remain in his will, to be blessed and find ourselves dangerous for the kingdom. The thoughts and the plans in my heart are the weeds of sin in my heart. And if they are left untended to just grow however, they bear the fruit of death. That's the result of sin. Technically, I can feel pretty good about myself. I'm on that side of the line of purity, and I have never intentionally taken someone's life, and I can feel pretty good. But that means I'm not dealing with all those things in between. There's a Bible study, that 52-week Bible study we've been talking about called the Heidelberg Catechism in, um, in week 40, question and answer 105. The question is, so what's God's will for us in this commandment? Here's the answer, it's on the screen. I'm not to belittle or insult or hate or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look or a gesture, and certainly not by actual deeds. And I'm not to be party to this in others, rather I am to put away all desire for revenge seems like we're okay, right? I mean, clean hands and a pure heart, that's our goal. But the texts in Exodus 20 and Matthew 5 are taking us way past the literal sense of homicide, the technical issue or the technical sense of, well, at least, at least I didn't take anyone's life today. The word of God pierces my heart to expose the weeds that grow in my heart before the fruit is ripe. The commandment addresses the sinful tendencies in my heart, which are the roots of murder. 
follow me over here. Some of the weeds. I'm going to try not to stumble and fall in all the ways. You can start to label some of these weeds, right? Bitterness, malice, hatred. That's a good one. We'll put two up for hatred. The reason is, you know, we think we're not supposed to hate, and we probably shouldn't. But even the psalmist says, Lord, do I not hate those who hate you? There's something about being angry without sinning and hating what God hates, huh? hating sin. So uh, sometimes I hate, and it's all flesh. Sometimes I lose and blur the lines between hating what God hates, which is sin, and I end up hating a person. Um, maybe a little further away from killing someone, a little closer to this side, if it were a spectrum of sin, is maybe I'm okay with some gestures. <laughs> I'm not from New York, but I know some languages. Ah, you're there. Wish I was Italian. We have thoughts. Anybody, anybody have a, ever have a thought that's less than pure? Come on. Four of us. All right. Confession tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Sometimes there's an opportunity, and um, when I'm tempted, that's not the sin, right? But when I nurture that thought and I let it take root, that's where I'm in trouble. So sometimes I even enjoy a temptation. How is it that if I'm a technical law keeper and I've never taken someone's life, I start to feel good about these weeds, and I'm okay with these weeds in my heart? Because even though I had a thought about you, I didn't take your life. Even though it's like, oh, man. Remember you said that thing that one? So I'm just looking at you. He never said anything bad to me. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. He's going, what? I don't remember. <laughs> remember that thing that you said, and then I, I harbored that, and I don't forgive you? And in that hole that I dug of unforgiveness, a root of bitterness is planted, and it grows. And then every time I see you, that's what I think about. And then I remove blessings. See how this gets really wicked quickly? And all of a sudden, we have these weeds in our life, and, and they're, if they're untended, you know how the weeds are. If you don't water your lawn, the grass dies. What grows in its place? Weeds. They don't need any water. They just need some time and space. And then if we start to fertilize them, oh. this is what the Word of God is getting at. So it pierces our hearts and exposes some of those weeds before the, before the fruit is ripe, like envy and hatred and anger and vindictiveness. Jesus says that in his eyes, they're connected to murder. That if I'm angry, I've already broken the law. Even if I don't take someone's life, my thoughts and my feelings and my desires about you are subject to God's righteousness. It's not just the work of my hands. It's also my heart, clean hands and a pure heart. The other day I saw a t-shirt. I thought it'd be perfect for wearing to the grocery store when there's long lines and only two cashiers. The t-shirt says... I may be smiling, but in my mind, I've slapped you three times already. <laughs> it's a little bit funny. Oh, yes, it is right, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. So we're also having confession on Wednesday. Come to both, Monday and Wednesday, okay? It's a little bit funny, but it ain't wrong. I mean, we have a lot of thoughts and feelings about people, and not all of those thoughts and feelings are good, right? They're not. The law is only fulfilled when my heart is right. Getting a little closer to that word, way on the right. Um, but let's talk a little bit more in the middle. What, what's behind all the killing then? What's behind all the killing in the abortion clinic? 64 million unborn children taken since 1973. How do we do that? What weeds are those that make us feel like, oh, well, we're on the right side of purity? Does that make sense? I'm not being political. This is biblical. Does that make sense? Say yes, if it does. I mean, what's behind all the shootings in the schools and the nightclubs and the public places and the private places? What, what's behind that? What weed has grown where we say, all right, it's time to cross the line? I mean, what's behind the brutality in the streets and in our homes when maybe it's not with a weapon, but it's with our words and we abuse someone? And there's empathy for people with bruises and scars, but the invisible ones, I've been told, take a lot longer to heal, Amen. How do we do that? What's behind the invasions of our homes, our privacy, our online data, and even countries? What is that that makes us destroy life? 
And those are the obvious questions. Those are the weeds that are really close to do not kill. You know, I don't, I don't understand why Russia invaded Ukraine. I'm sure there are reasons. I'm not saying that they're good. I'm just sure they have reasons. I'm not sure why people break into the stores. And I see those videos of like 20 young people just running into a store, grabbing everything they can and running out. And then that guy, he goes broke. Or they take his life. And I don't, I don't know what weeds those are, but somehow the ones taller, or the closer to do not kill, they're taller, they're, they're more mature, they have fruit hanging on them. And, and then there's the other ones a little closer to the other side that are less obvious, like the gesture or having disregard or snubbing someone of not even saying hi to them, not even talking to someone, and then when they're not in the room, there's gossip with vindictiveness, or there's bitterness or ill will. See how that grows? And we just, we just let those go. We don't know that there are weeds in the Garden of Eden. I had to laugh at this one. One of the things I'm most ups, upset about, no, it's not true. It's not even closest to the most. Sorry, let me re rephrase that. One of the things that upsets me most frequently <laughs> is when people run red lights. You know I talk to you about this, so you know it's an issue for me. I don't know, I'll talk to Peter at the gate when I get there. Uh, um, but every day, I mean, I travel Baldwin every day. I live in Hudsonville, so every day, back and forth on Baldwin. And it's at least three times on each of those six and a half mile trips. It's just unbelievable to me. And it used to be three a month, now it's three a day, right? And anyway, Cheryl and I were driving the other day, and uh, um, someone, it was our turn to go, and someone ran the red light then, uh, so we had to wait. I'm glad we didn't jump on the green, right? And so we waited. We looked both ways in case his cousins were following him. And uh, so here we both go down Baldwin the same way, and we were at the same stoplight together. I was in the right lane. Other guy was in the left lane. Cheryl says, scoot up a little bit. She's looking. I go, why? She goes, I want to see what stupid looks like. <laughs> <laughs> all right, not, not all of that's true. She didn't say it that nice. Scoot up. I want to see what dumb looks like. No. <laughs> if anybody has a mother-in-law apartment, I'm going to be needing that this <laughs> week. I told her I was going to tell you that story. Most of it's true, and the point is made. We don't even think about the weeds in our gardens. We don't even think that running a red light is going to take someone else's life. We don't, never crosses our mind. We're just, we just got to get to our appointment. That's just one example of the weeds that are over there. That They're fine. We, we like weeds sometimes. And the law can't actually change our hearts. Did you know that? Only the presence of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ in our hearts can change our hearts. And somehow we've, we've drawn this line here, this line of purity way over here, and for centuries, people would say, you know what, you're, you're right, you're right. It's, uh, I have not taken anyone else's life. And Jesus says, yeah, you've heard it said, you shall not kill. But I say to you, where does he move the line of purity? <laughs> what does that do for all the weeds in my heart? It connects them directly to breaking the law. You've heard it said, don't take someone's life, but I say to you, anyone who's angry in his heart with his brother and sister has already broken the commandment. That puts all of us in a different box. What did you put here? What, what, what's the opposite of um, thou shalt not murder? Say it out loud, now's your chance. Pardon? Like? Life. Close. Say it again, say it. Yeah. yeah. We got stuck with, what's the opposite of don't kill? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't kill anybody. And Jesus says, oh no, it's way more than that. I mean, the catechism looked at like 30 different scriptures when it made that answer that I'm also supposed to be protecting someone. We become satisfied with as long as we don't cross the line uh, of taking someone's life that we're not sinning and our gardens now become full of weeds and it's no wonder that crazy is the new normal. It's normal to hate you in a second even if I don't know you. Come on. It's now normal to commit social homicide because you're just a little bit different than I am. 
it's now preferred that I just grab as much as I can and leave you with nothing. And the sweetest looking weeds are the poisonous ones. And we end up with no standard of truth, no morality, no objective law. It's all how I feel today, and all my feelings are just fine, and I don't feel like I have murdered you at all, so I must be okay. Isn't that being in danger? And when I'm that relative, then I don't care what others do or say. If others want to be lawbreakers, what's that to me? And so we march on the streets with red-hot rage and vicious slander for the right to kill the unborn. We riot in the streets and destroy property and take life, and we believe that vengeance is ours. We strip the flesh from the bones of others on social media, or we bully them on the bus just because we can. All of these weeds produce death and sinful anger. Different than righteous anger, sinful anger is subject to the same judgment as murder. Well, that was a lot of fun. (laughs) So let's talk about solutions. We're almost done. It's 11.05. Let's talk about solutions. We don't want to leave the weeds untended. We need a weed killer, amen? The opposite of thou shalt not is love. This is where the word of God draws the line, right next to love. Everything here on the left side of that is a weed that needs to be tended. Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer seven, says, is it enough then that we don't kill our neighbor? No, by condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God in his word tells us, here it is, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to be patient and peace-loving and gentle and merciful and friendly to them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. And so Jesus puts a lid on this issue when he's confronted by an expert of the law who was trying to draw a white line of purity in a different place than Jesus was. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, on one occasion, this expert, a law lawyer, stood up to test Jesus, said, teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your strength and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Love, and you will live. Because love, that's it. That's the opposite of murder. The opposite of murder is love. Love is a weed killer. When the Holy Spirit of God cleans my heart and sanctifies me with righteousness and I love God with all that I am and the word of God moves in and cuts down the weeds and teaches me how to live, I'm able to love others too. The fruit of the weeds of anger lead to death, but the fruit of the Spirit, you know it, say it with me, there are nine of them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Finish the sentence. Against these things, there is no law. When I'm full of love, I begin to see the weeds of sin in my heart, and I learn to hate them. I want them to be pulled out. I don't want to be numb about my sin. I don't want to be in love with weeds. I may not have taken a life, but I've been angry. I don't want to fly off the handle with rage or fly through intersections with red lights. I don't want to be that guy. I want the word of God to direct my life and my steps. I want clean hands and a pure heart. And I know I need God's help. Romans 12 says, don't take revenge. Leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what should we do? Feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Don't overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. So I want my heart to ache, and I hope yours does too. It's, it hurts to have those weeds pulled. It leaves, div- it leaves divots. And I want my heart to ache because of anger against sin. I want to be angry at my sin I want to ache when I see billboards like the one that Governor Newsom, do you know him? Southern, or California? He's the governor over there? He actually purchased billboards in conservative states quoting Mark 12, 31. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. He bought those billboards in those conservative states to offer California-funded abortions for anybody who wants one. Come out and we'll take care of it, he says. How in the world did this insanity happen? This is our culture. We don't know that those are weeds. I want to ache because lives are taken from the womb. We can no longer be numb. And this has been happening for 50 years. So if you're under 50, 
this is your normal. I want to ache when people are abused and marginalized. Proverbs 31 says, I must be the voice for the voiceless. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, for the rights of those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. That's marching orders for the people of God. I want to ache when the spouse or the child is rejected and when a person literally or figuratively dies from abuse and slander. I want to ache when the value of a person is murdered and no one seems to care. When instead of love, people are trusted or treated as objects. Galatians 5 says the acts of the flesh, these are the weeds, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, hatred, discord, jealousy and fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension and factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. These are all the acts of the flesh, the weeds that kill and destroy. You can read it, Galatians 5. And the solution is love the fruits of the Spirit. Scripture says, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit, for the Spirit of the law is love. Imagine taking every thought and action and putting it on the chart. How close to loving your neighbor would it be? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have redeemed me and saved me. You have set me free. Today, it is my prayer for my heart and our hearts that you would cleanse our hearts and minds from the sin that makes us use our freedom to indulge the flesh. Help us instead to serve others humbly in love. Father, forgive my conceit for living according to my own flesh, for provoking and envying others. Help me instead to live by the fruit of the Spirit. Your love fulfills your law. Forgive me for thinking and behaving like vengeance is mine, leaving no room for you to work. Help me instead to feed my enemy and give water to the thirsty and to overcome evil with good. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of our lives, our only true God, and we seek your face today. So move into our hearts, dwell with us, cleanse us with the blood of the Lamb. Forgive us for trusting idols and ideologies, false gods and our own feelings. Help us instead to trust in you alone, your words, your commands. Help us to love others as we have been loved. Help us to love our neighbor so much that we can't stand a second longer when anyone is disconnected from you. Jesus, give us the desire to give our lives for the sake of another, to set aside our own advantages so that someone else might know you and have life. Help us to do whatever it takes to protect and promote life to stand strong in the fight against Satan and his angels that come to only kill, steal, and destroy. Lord, bless your church today. Help us to stand in the gap for those who cannot, to be the voice for the voiceless, to be strong in the battle, to be covered with spiritual armor so that when the end of the battle comes, we'll find ourselves standing. Father, in your presence and for your glory, we stand today. We ask not only for your forgiveness, but the blessing of strength to fight the good fight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.